and get started. We might have some more people trickling in. Um, my name is Heather Zaponik. I'm one of the counselors here. Um, and we are here, our obviously for financial aid night. So in the past, we've had, during financial aid night, we've had tables set out and scholarship fair um, style out in the hallway. So if you've had older students and you've been to one of these before, you might have seen that. This year, because you can apply for financial aid so much earlier, the scholarship committees really aren't ready with their app, all of their applications to be represented here. So what um, Mrs. Zerval is one of the other counselors here, she's going to show you just briefly um, on Navion's how to access students access local scholarships. We do have some local scholarship information already on Navion's and then after that we're going to introduce Kim Leggett from the Canton Student Loan Foundation to talk about her program and Kurt Drotliff from Kent State Stark to um, talk about financial aid. Thanks, Heather. Um, Kristen Zerbaugh, I see a lot of familiar faces out there. Um, I just wanted to show you for a second, I know you may have heard some things about Naviance and, and maybe here or there your students have gotten in. Um, this is our main resource for college readiness. Everything is housed in Naviance. If you don't have your password as a parent, you can obtain that from your student's counselor or um, your student can contact their counselor to get their password as well. When the students log into Naviance, this is what they see, okay? There are tabs all across the top. Courses, colleges, careers, about me, and a planner. Um, I could spend forever talking about all those tabs, but for the purpose of tonight, I want to show you for a moment where the students can see the Local scholarships, it's on the colleges tab, okay? And if you scroll down, see the scholarship list? This is where we're putting all of the local scholarships, okay? So there's no filing cabinet somewhere in the counselor's office where they have to sift through, it's all right here. Um, and if you scroll down, I mean, we have, this, this list gets quite long. Um, like Heather said, uh, the scholarship agencies are still in the process of updating their forms and so forth. So we only put them out once the forms are updated, okay? And those would be scholarships through the Plain Local Schools Foundation. Those would be scholarships through, for example, the Plain Township Rotary and other ones that we become aware of. This is where we funnel them, okay? So if you were to, um, let's just click on this one. Click on it. It gives you some information. It gives you maybe the website here where you can find more information and also the actual scholarship forms, if they provide one, are, up, are uploaded as a PDF so that you can access it. Right, I'm not, okay. Um, oh my goodness. I don't think it'll let me open it here. Maybe it will. Um, I don't want to take up too much time doing this, but um, that's where you would obtain the actual application forms for the local scholarships. Okay, we get that question a lot. Um, also, on the colleges tab, if you scroll again all the way to the bottom, National Scholarship Search. You click on that. This is, um, through Sally May, a national scholarship search. So based on this three-page profile your student would fill out, scholarships would be funneled to them, emailed to them that they could apply for. Okay, so these are scholarships that are outside of the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid that Kurt is going to talk about. Um, but I just want to show you where all of this is housed in Naviance. Okay. Um, we've also shown this to students. We've been in every single English 4 classroom, every AP English 4 classroom. Students have been shown this. So if they say, no, my counselor didn't show me. Yes, we did. Um, you know, if they're confused about it, stop down and see us or give us an email or call. Email or call. We're happy to help. Okay. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to show you that before I hand it over to uh, Kim. This is Kim Leggett from um, the Canton Student Loan Foundation. 
Hi. Um, as I said, my name is Kim. I'm from the Kansas Student Loan Foundation. I'm the director. We are a nonprofit foundation that was established uh, in 1922. So we are 94 years old this year. And uh, we are, our mission is to provide low interest student loans for graduates of Stark County High School, only Stark County High School. So we're available once you look at all the free money that's available for your students, so grants and scholarships, and if you find you still need some help, we are a really good first place to come. In order to apply for one of our loans, students have to have graduated from a Stark County High School. They have to have and maintain a 2.0 GPA, and they have to be enrolled in school full time. If all those things are true, then they're eligible to apply. Uh, there are, the, the amounts available are $3,000 a year. The maximum amount is $12,000, so they can get $3,000 a year for four years. Um, <coughs> students who come to us a little later, let's say if they didn't come to us as freshmen, we do, we are able, we are able to loan to them as well. So the amounts are about $3,000 a year. The max amount is $12,000 unless they decide to go into grad school. I usually don't spend a lot of time talking about grad school because I don't want to overwhelm you looking at going into undergrad right now. Um, but there are, thanks, there are um, funds available. This is going to be our third year that we do have graduate school uh, funds available for students. They have to be current students of the foundation. They can't be new students. So uh, there's that $3,000 available. There's no fees that are attached to these uh, loans, and it's a private loan. The deadline is June 1st. The applications are available starting in January, and all the information, this is our brochure, and all the information is in here uh, for you to take a look at. So I urge you that if you're considering looking at loans, ask some questions, you know, um, are there fees involved in this loan? What's the interest rate? When does when do the payments start? When does the interest start accruing? For ours, we don't have any fees. The interest and the payments are deferred as long as the students are in school full time. So that interest and payments are deferred at least four years if they're going to a four-year program. Could be longer if they're going on to grad school. If they go on to grad school full-time, we continue to defer. So we've had some doctoral students, uh, MDs, those kinds of things, who have had their loans deferred for 10, 10 years. Um, our loans for any kind of schooling. So it can be we've had students in auto body, we've had students in cosmetology. Um, they can go anywhere. Uh, as long as it's an accredited school. We've had students go to Switzerland for culinary school. So it's for any kind of schooling after high school. Um, the reason we're able to do what we do is because we have students who are repaying their loans. So those funds come into the foundation and they go back out to other students. So when we talk to students, we kind of talk about it being a pay, with, pay it forward kind of program. You borrow from the foundation, you pay your loan back, and you're helping somebody else out with their education. We also have people and um, organizations who donate to the foundation because they want to help a Stark County student with their education. So with those two funds, we're able to disperse loans. We do about 1.6 million every year. So we see a lot of Stark County graduates. Um, over the past you know, 94 years, we've loaned out about $33 million. So we are here if you need us. Um, I think I've covered all the high points. I set our deadline June 1st. Really important that you meet that. We can't take any applications after that. And there are some things that are required along with the application, and all of that is, is included on the application. You'll have to get a transcript from your school and things like that. Does anybody have any questions for me about the foundation or about the uh, loan? Yes. Yes, Melissa. <laughs> yes. It can be five. Uh, right, and that and that doesn't matter. A lot of people are concerned that if their student it takes longer for them to graduate, they have to start repaying their loan. The only thing that kicks somebody back into having to repay the loan is if they're not going to school full time. Um, some students who are going to a five-year program, like for engineering, sometimes they, they, they uh, take a little less money every year to make it last for the five years. Some students just go ahead and take the 3000 a year and then uh, figure out what they're going to do one of those years. Anything? Yes? Six percent. I didn't say that. Yes, it's a six percent interest rate. However, the effective rate's about one and a half to two percent based on the length of time that students have that money interest-free because it's interest-free the whole time they're in school. 
And that's really important because there are some loans out there that the interest starts accruing right away and there are some loans out there that they have to start paying on right away. So you want to ask those kinds of questions. And we have good terms. We're a nonprofit. That's what allows us to do that. I don't, our interest rate hasn't changed since the 50s. Anything else? I thought, I, yeah. Right, so we do have graduate school funds, and that's 4000 a year for two years. So that's an additional $8,000 that are available, but the student must have borrowed from us in their undergraduate program to borrow for grad school. Yes, usually we don't hear about them wanting to borrow for grad school until they're graduating. Yeah. Yes. No, um, there's a three month grace period and then they have to start to repay the loan. The payments start off at $100 a month the first year, they go to $150 the second year, go to $195 the third year. They never go any higher than $195. If they borrow the full $12,000, it takes about seven years to pay the loan off in full, but if they pay it off early, there's no penalty. And if, it's, if they borrow for grad school, then the max loan amount's 20000 and the payments are a little higher, just because we didn't want ta it to take kids forever to have to pay their loans back. But it's pretty reasonable and pretty uh, lower payments than you typically see with, uh, with loans. Yeah? What's the difference between $3,000 and $12,000? It's $3,000 a year. So it's 3,000 for your freshman year, 3,000 sophomore, 3,000 so to equal 12. The 12 is the lifetime maximum for undergraduate borrowing. You're guaranteed those funds every year. So once you borrow, you know that you can get that money the next year and the next year as long as you stay in school full time and keep that 2.0 GPA or higher. Because we want you to know once you borrow that you can count on that money every year because that's really important. Anything else? Any other questions? Nope? Okay, thank you very much. If you have any questions, there's only three of us in the office. My name is Kim, and um, Lori and Sandy are there as well, and we're always happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. I'd like to turn it over to Kurt Drotleff. Would you like the mic? Do you like the mic? Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name's Kurt, I'm a financial aid counselor at Kent State University Stark Campus. It's my task to go over a presentation with you over the federal financial aid process. A Couple things I want to mention before we start. It's not Kent State specific. Federal regulations drive the process, so all schools do it very similarly. Also, there is a copy of the PowerPoint. Hopefully you picked one up on your way in. You could follow along if you wish. Finally, don't hesitate to ask questions right during the presentation. Either shout something out at me or wave your hand, give me a signal. I'll answer it right then and there. Don't be shy. If you have a question, other people probably have the same question and are scared to ask or they don't even realize they have that question. But uh, let's start. First of all, a overview of what we'll talk about today the federal government's philosophy of financial aid will spend a great deal of time on the FAFSA, submitting the free application for federal student aid every year, the FAFSA. We'll talk about types of financial aid, both financial aid you don't pay back, grants like the Pell Grant and scholarships, and then also financial aid that you do pay back, loans and work study. Don't shoot the messenger, but the government considers loans to be a type of financial aid. You may disagree, but... Um, we'll talk about how to de determine college costs, direct costs to the school you're interested in. We'll also talk about financial need. Like, oftentimes, scholarships will say you have to show financial need. You do that through the FAFSA. We'll talk about a timeline, what to do, when, um, when to expect things to happen, and finally a few upcoming events. So let's get started. First of all, the federal government's philosophy of financial aid. First, it's available to all families regardless of income. Also, it's the primary responsibility of the family to pay the cost to the extent they're able. Once we start talking about specific amounts, like what is the largest Pell Grant possible? How much 
of a student, federal student loan can a freshman have, you'll realize that they really mean that. Okay, the FAFSA is online. There's no paper FAFSA forms anymore, which means you sign the FAFSA electronically with a username password. There's three big changes to the FAFSA this year. The username password is the first big change. In the past, students and parents had to obtain a four-digit PIN number, and you would sign into the FAFSA with that PIN number. Any parents have an older child and they've done the FAFSA in the past and they have a four-digit PIN number? Okay. You will have to get a username password. The PIN numbers won't work anymore. So the very first thing you must do before you go to the FAFSA website, go to the government's PIN website, sfaid.ed.gov. And again, this is on the handout, Federal Student Aid ID. Either parent will work their way through this and obtain a username password. And that username password you'll use every year because you submit the FAFSA every year. Once the parent has their username password, then the student goes back to the main page and they create their username password. It's a long process. They ask you challenge questions. And you know how usually there's a drop down list and it says you choose the question? Well, there's a couple where you choose the question yourself, which I've never seen before. They also ask you for an email address. Use an email address you have immediate access to because they send you an email immediately with this confirmation code. You use the confirmation code to finish out the process and obtain the username password. Another thing we've noticed is the parent and the student should not use the same email address. For some reason, that stops the process. They might be worried about fraud. So don't use the same email address. But again, it's very important to obtain the username and password for the student and one parent. Any questions on this section before we move on? Good. Now, you people with the PIN number, dig the PIN number out because it will go faster for you if you have your PIN number with you. I think if you don't have your PIN number, then it takes two or three days for the government's computer to update and you can get your username password after a few days. But if you have your PIN number, you can get it in one sitting. Okay, once you have the username passwords, then you go to the FAFSA website, fafsa.gov, like government. Do not mistakenly go to fafsa.com. Fafsa.com is an independent organization where they will submit the FAFSA for you, but they charge you. I think it's up to $90 now. If you Google FAFSA, fafsa.com may come up above fafsa.gov. If you accidentally go to the wrong website and you end up with the screen where they're asking you to pay, just exit out of there, go to the correct website, and start all over again. It's the free application for federalstudentaid.gov. And again, the student will click the login button. The student will log in with their username password, and you'll work your way through the FAFSA. Before I forget, make sure you pick the correct school year. You seniors are going to pick the 2017-2018 FAFSA, correct? This year's FAFSA, the 2016-2017, is still available at the website. So pick next year's FAFSA. Okay, that's an easy mistake to make. Again, don't be shy about questions. Work your way through the FAFSA, read it carefully. They explain exactly what they want. It's very clear. Try to avoid errors, things like social security numbers and date of birth. If your social security number begins with 301, don't accidentally put 103, those kinds of things. Date of birth, you know, they tell you it's month, day, year. So if you're born April 8th, it's 0408, not 0804, those kinds of things. The government takes 
your name, social, and date of birth and puts it through the Social Security Administration's database and everything must match exactly. Use the name on the, use, put your name on the FAFSA as it appears on your Social Security card. So if your son's name is Andrew, but he goes by Drew, if it says Andrew on the Social Security card, use Andrew. Divorced or remarried parent, this is a common question. The government's rule on this is if the parents are divorced, you should use the parent who provides over 50% of the student's support, or they live with the student over 50% of the time. I guess the custodial parent, you'd call it. Now, if that custodial parent is remarried, you have to include the income for the step-parent. That's the government's rule. So if you remarried a billionaire, that's just the way that goes. Um, if custody is strictly even, then you should pick the parent who makes less money. Okay. Parent and student income mismatch. What they mean by that is sometimes, and again, these are just common mistakes that you should be careful of. Let's say the parent makes $30,000 and they paid $3,000 in taxes. People will say they'll put $3,000 in the income question and $30,000 in taxes paid question, and you know the government's computer will flag that. That's a mistake. If you make $30,000, don't accidentally add a zero so it looks like you make $300,000 a year, those kinds of things. Any questions? Something I can think of, um, some people ask, well, what if the student is out on their own? Or what if they're living with grandma and grandpa? The only way that grandma and grandpa gets included on the FAFSA is if they've legally adopted the child. If it's custody, and it usually is, then the child has to get the information from one of their parents, and hopefully they'll be able to do that. The only way around that is if the child had to leave the household because there's some type of abusive, toxic situation, if that's the case, you should contact your school's financial aid office. At Kent State, we call it a dependency appeal form, where the student explains the situation, provides supporting documentation for it. If we accept it, we'll make the student what's called independent. Independent students don't include their parents' income on the FAFSA. For the vast majority of you, you're going to be a dependent student and you have to include your parent on the FAFSA. When you work your way through the FAFSA, there's a section to determine whether you're independent or dependent. Basically, you have to answer yes to one of the questions to make yourself independent. The most popular one is, are you 24 years old? Another one, are you married? Are you in graduate school? Um, are you a military veteran? Do you have children that you support? Are both parents deceased? Are you in foster care? Are you in legal guardianship? Are you emancipated? Are you legally homeless? Until you can answer yes to one of those questions, you have to include the parents on the FAFSA. Again, don't shoot the messenger, but I guess the government's attitude on this is it's the responsibility of the family to pay to the extent they're able. If people had a choice, everybody would be independent. Again, any questions? I think we need just one question to, you know, break that barrier. Okay. Uh, now, next. Eventually, you'll get to a screen where they ask you questions about how you filed your 2015 income tax return. And that's the second big change in the FAFSA. It used to be the FAFSA was based on the previous year's income tax information. The government's changed it, so now that it's based on income tax from two years previous. So that means you're looking at 2015 income tax return, which is good because at this point, everybody has submitted their 2015 income tax return, even if they've filed for an extension. It used to be people who didn't file right away had to estimate on the FAFSA. 
That's not the case anymore. So what they'll do, they'll ask you, did you file 2015 income tax return? If you did, did you file single? Did you file married joint? Um, did you file married separate? Did you file head of household? Depending on your answer, and for the most part, they will take you to this IRS data retrieval tool. I know IRS scares people, but the government encourages you to use this, and so does Kent State, so does the colleges. What happens is you fill out the form. Basically, you put your address here. You click Submit. If it works like it should, all of your income information will be pulled over and automatically populated into the FAFSA. So things like adjusted gross income, amount of taxes paid, that will automatically populate, which is really nice. Um, it saves time and it's more accurate. It's been available about two years now. Two years ago, it was kind of buggy. It, you know, it, there was trouble. Last year, it wasn't too bad, and hopefully this year, it'll even be better. I know that the address you input has to be exactly the same as the address you put on your tax return. So if you live on 7th Street and you wrote out the word street on your tax return, you need to read out or write out the word street on this also. If it doesn't work for you, it's not a big deal. It just takes you back to the FAFSA website and you keep answering questions one after the other. It's a good idea to have a copy of your 2015 income tax return in front of you because for questions like adjusted gross income, it will tell you if you filed a 1040EZ return, it'll tell you what line to use. It'll, if you used a 1040A tax return, it'll tell you what line to use. But again, most of the time, this should work, we're hoping. Oh, OK. Wait a moment. Let me come down here. There was a question. OK. I just wondered, is the deadline still uh, right before um, Valentine's Day? Her question is, what's the deadline for the FAFSA? There is no deadline. It's just the sooner you do it, the faster the school can get you awarded. We have students right now who are thinking about starting spring of 2017, so they're doing this year's FAFSA right now. Usually it takes about a week for the school to get the FAFSA results, and then at least at Kent State, our computer takes about another week to get them awarded. Schools have what's called a priority processing deadline. What that means is there are three federal financial aid programs that have limited funding, and every school gets a limited amount, and they award it as they see fit. Usually, it's first come, first serve. So the sooner you do the FAFSA, the more likely you are to be eligible for those three programs. At Kent State, with the FAFSA becoming available October 1st, we've moved our priority processing deadline to December 15th. So we're encouraging students to get the FAFSA done by mid-December. But again, it's not a deadline. Does that answer your question? OK, there's another question here. Give me a moment. Yes? Well, that actually brought up another additional question. Is that mid-December to file or to enroll by next fall or by next spring? Her question about the um, priority processing deadline, that's just for the FAFSA, not applying for the school itself. When you, work, when you submit the FAFSA, there's a section where you include all the schools you're interested in. You can include as many schools as you want. There's a drop-down list. First, there's the state. So if you're interested in College of Worcester, you would pick Ohio. Then another drop-down list, and you would scroll all the way down to the W's for Worcester. If you're interested in Penn State, you'd pick Pennsylvania and then Penn State. When you include that school on your FAFSA, that school uploads the FAFSA results, and they get you awarded. Now, at Kent State, 
We'll upload your FAFSA results even if you're not an accepted student yet, but we won't actually award you and send an award letter until you've applied and been accepted. You can apply to the school first and then do the FAFSA or vice versa. Okay? Okay, good. Anything else right now before we... Yes? Her question is, when you include the school, I can speak for Kent State, um, we're hoping to start awarding incoming freshmen in mid to late December. It used to be that the FAFSA was available January 1st of every year, and we would get incoming freshmen awarded in March. Well, this is the first year where the FAFSA is available three months earlier. October 1st, so it's forcing schools to push everything forward. I can't speak to other schools. At Kent State, we will send a paper award letter to incoming freshmen. It's the only paper award letter you'll ever get. If we make a change, or let's say next year, we send an email to the student's kent.edu email address telling them they've been awarded. The student goes into their online account um, we're the Kent State Golden Flashes, so we call it Flashline. Students log into Flashline and they can view their financial aid, they can accept their loans, they can view their bill, they can register for classes, they can drop class, they can do all that. Some schools won't send a paper award letter at all, so it'll depend on the school. And you know, it's to save money. The, okay, yeah? No. Her question is, is the amount of money you're eligible for dependent on the school? No. You get the same Pell Grant regardless of what school you're at or how expensive that school is. Freshman loan amount is the same regardless of school. And we'll talk about amounts soon. Okay, there was a question here. Yes? If you file an amended tax return, is there a process or catch-up time? Her question is, if you filed an amended tax return, my understanding is for 2015, the deadline is October 15th. So you should have it filed by now. Remember, it's the 2015 tax return, not 2016. So if you filed an extension for 2015, I think the deadline was a few days ago, I think. It was, but okay. if you can still send in an amended return. So when you're on the data receipt page, is there a time lapse between the IRS? Yes, um, I see what you mean. When you submit your tax return, it takes the IRS a week or two to process it before the, ta the IRS data retrieval tool will work for you. And if you send your tax return through the mail, you don't file electronically, it takes even longer. But again, if the data retrieval tool doesn't work for you, you just work your way through the FAFSA. Now, once the IRS processes your tax return, they'll probably send you an email saying, go back to the FAFSA website and make corrections or use the data retrieval tool. Does that answer your question? Okay. There was another question over here somewhere? Yes. Yeah, I, for everything except those three programs that I talked about earlier that has limited funding, it's the same for every school. You'll get the same Pell Grant at every school, you'll get the same loan amount at every school, and we'll talk about what those amounts are soon. Okay, question? Only, her question is, her daughter had a summer job, only if it was during 2015. If it was during 2015, there's a, sec, there's a student section on the FAFSA where they ask for the student's adjusted gross income and the student's taxes paid. But if she wasn't employed during 2015, those would be zeros for now. Now there's a question over here, yes? That's an excellent question, and we have a slide just for that soon enough. Her question is, what if 
the family's income is less now than it was in 2015? We'll talk about that. That's a good question. The government does ask about assets, and they're very clear about what an asset is. Try not to get too worried about assets. Some parents, they say, well, I own these stocks and bonds, or I own these rental properties, I'm gonna get killed. Assets are, to a large extent, sheltered on the FAFSA. Let me try to generalize. When the government processes your FAFSA, they take all your financial information, they put it through this really complicated formula, but they come up with what's called an expected family contribution, an EFC. It's a measure of how strong the family is financially. The lower the EFC, the more financial need you show, and the more likely you are to be eligible for grants, like the Pell Grant. The government takes a large, well, the government takes a small percentage of the parent's adjusted gross income, puts it toward this EFC, a small percentage, a very small percentage of the assets. Now, for the student, the government takes a much larger percentage of the student's income, if any, and a much larger percentage of the student's assets, if any, and puts it toward this EFC. The, the school gets the EFC, the results, they put it through a computer awarding program and awards the appropriate amounts of everything. Okay? Okay, good, good. Um, another question sometimes people ask about debts. The government's not interested in your debts. Don't ask me why. I think, I think it's because at least their attitude is people determine their debts to a large extent, like what car to drive, how often to buy a new car, what kind of vacation to take, those kinds of things. Oh, the 529 plan, or sometimes they're called OTTA, Ohio Tuition Trust Authority, it should be in the parent's name as a parent asset, which is good because remember, they take a smaller percentage of the parent's assets. Now, if it's like, if the grandparent has a 529 plan, it doesn't get included at all. It's only if the parent has the 529 plan. Okay, there's a question. Yes? Her question is, if you make over 40,000, you're not gonna get a Pell Grant. There's a lot of variables. Um, how many people are in the household? Especially how many people are in college. Like if there's five people in the household and one person in college, compared to the same family's income where they have five people in the household and three people in college, the EFCs for the three people in college family is gonna be much lower. There's no hard and fast rule. Um, you don't really know for sure whether you'll be eligible for a Pell Grant unless you do the FAFSA, so it's worth doing the FAFSA. Yes, yeah, exactly. At the very least, you'd be eligible for federal student loans that you don't have to use. If you're really interested, you can Google um, FAFSA EFC hand calculation or something like that, and you can print out the directions for how to calculate the EFC. Now, it's a really long process. If you don't like doing your taxes, you won't like doing this either. But it would, if you work your way through it, it would give you a good idea of what the government's rationale is and what they protect and what they don't, et cetera. Plus, we encourage all students to do the FAFSA to make them eligible for scholarships. Um, Plus, you don't really, you don't know for sure if you'll need that loan. You know, let's say you're able to pay out of pocket, but then your car breaks down during the semester and you need a significant amount of money right away. If you've done the FAFSA and you've been awarded, you can get the loan money right away compared to if you haven't done the FAFSA at all yet. So we encourage students to do the FAFSA every year. Question? Good question. <laughs> what assets aren't included? 
The family house, um, business as long as it employs less than 100 people. Again, the FAFSA is very clear on what they want. You know, take the time to read the small print and it'll, you know, it, it'll go smoothly for you. Retirement plans are not included. Yes. Health savings accounts, at the very worst, it would only be the amount you contributed during 2015, I would think. I'm not positive, but I think. Yeah, I, I'm not positive on that either. Um, our contact information is on the last slide. Give us a call and we'll get to the bottom of it. Somebody in the office will know. Okay, once you reach the end, the student, they simply click the sign button. Because remember, the student logged in with their username and password at the beginning, so the government already has that. The parent, on the other hand, the parent needs to enter their username and password and then click sign. It's very important that the parent does this. Every year we get a list of rejected FAFSAs and one of the biggest reasons is the parent didn't sign it electronically. I don't know why, the parent usually includes their income on the FAFSA, but for whatever reason it doesn't click that they need to sign it. When that happens, we end up having to contact the student, try to contact the student, tell them what the problem is and get them to fix it. When you submit the FAFSA, you immediately get what's called a confirmation page. It will list the schools you're interested, you included on the FAFSA. The biggest thing is, they're going to tell you what your expected family contribution is. The EFC equals, and there should be a number there. If there's no number there, that's a clue that you've made a mistake on the FAFSA. You need to go back and figure out what you've done. Now, even if it says 0000, zero, 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 zero that means you show the most financial need. It's only a problem if there's no number there at all. And that's another thing about the EFC. I wish they'd use a different term because expected family contribution, you would think that's the amount you need to pay and then somebody else picks up the rest, that's not the case at all. It's strictly a measure of how strong the family is financially. It's not necessarily at all what you're going to end up paying for the school you're interested in, right? Okay. Also, it will say Pell Grant estimate. Now, like the lady in the corner said, it's very possible you won't be eligible for a Pell Grant at all. Now, it'll also say direct Stafford loan. That's your student federal loan. Freshmen are allowed to have $5,500 per year, so it will say $5,500 here. And that's submitting the FAFSA. It usually takes two or three days for the government's computer to do whatever it does you will get an email saying that your FAFSA was processed and that you should go back to the FAFSA website and view the SAR, the Student Aid Report. It's a good idea to do that. The SAR is a summary of all the answers you put down on the FAFSA. Try to catch any mistakes right away. So if you, like I said, if you make $30,000 a year and you accidentally added a couple zeros, catch it now and make a correction. Okay, there was the question about income change. The FAFSA is based on 2015 income, period. If the family has lost income for a variety of reasons, and you can see some of the popular reasons, what you do is you contact the school's financial aid office.
At Kent State, we call it a special circumstances form, where the student prints the form out, fills the form out, they provide the appropriate documentation, like if you lost your job, when did you lose your job? Are you on unemployment? If so, how much and when does it end? All that kind of thing. There's a counselor up at the Kent Campus Financial Aid Office. All she does is these special circumstances forms. She takes the family's new income and determines a new EFC. And the hope is that the EFC goes down enough to make the student eligible for more aid. But that's a good question. Ready? Move on. Okay, now we're going to move into the next section of the presentation. Gift aid um, grants. By far the biggest grant is the Pell Grant. It's based on EFC. I think you need to have an EFC of about 5,200 or less to be eligible for a Pell Grant at all. And then it's worth maybe $500 a year. Then, as the EFC goes down, the Pell Grant goes up. The school will give you the appropriate Pell Grant. This year, the biggest Pell Grant, if you have a zero EFC, it's $5,815 a year. And then the school will split that. Um, at Kent State, we're a semester school, fall and spring, so we split that evenly. 2907 and 2908. We have a lot of zero EFC, so I have it memorized. I'm not that good at math. Um, there's a smaller grant program called the SEOG, the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. That's the first of those three programs that have limited funding. So schools will dole that out as they see fit. So one school may give you an, e an SEOG, another school may not give you one at all, and a third school may give you a bigger one than the first school, which is unfortunate, but it's the way it works. The Pell Grant, you get the same amount regardless of what school you're at, but the SEOG, Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, that can vary between schools. The TEACH grant is for certain education majors that the government feels we need more teachers, like math and science and things like that. We'll talk about scholarships separately. Self-help, work-study is the second of those three programs that have limited funding. So again, the sooner you do the FAFSA, the more likely you are to be eligible for a work-study award. Work study is an on-campus job. You get paid every two weeks, depending on how many hours you work. And then we have the loans, and we'll talk about loans. That has its own slide. Okay, yes, question. It's a good question. Her question is, her child is a junior, and she's curious what's going to happen in two years. There is a website called FAFSA Forecaster. You can Google it. It's like FAFSA and then the number four and then Caster. You'll, you'll find it. You can do kind of a pseudo FAFSA and see what your EFC would be and what you'd be eligible for. That's a good question. Okay, there's another question right here. Yes. It's a good question, and I should have mentioned this. Federal work study is nice because, remember I told you that the government takes a large percentage of the student's income and puts it toward that EFC? If the income is from work study, they don't do that. So that's a nice perk for the student. Schools like it because the government pays 75% of the wage and the school only 25%, which frees up money for more on-campus jobs. At Kent State, to get an on-campus job, you have to do the FAFSA. Now, if the family makes too much money, the EFC is too high, we still give them the job. It's called campus-funded, and we pay 100%.
but most students do show enough financial need to be eligible for work study. That answer your questions? Um, it would get counted as regular income and it would get counted toward that EFC. Maybe next year she should specifically ask the financial aid office about work study and see if, there's, if she's eligible and if there's funding available. Because remember, federal work study has limited funding. Yeah, I should have mentioned all that. It, it, so you guys are asking good questions. Okay, moving to scholarships. Let me try to explain this, see if I can. When I explain, or when I go over scholarships with students, I break it into three main parts. The first and most important is the scholarships you're offered by the school, the incoming freshman scholarships from the school. It's all up to the school how they award their scholarships. At Kent State, you have to be accepted by a certain date. At the Kent campus, if you're accepted by January 15th, you're automatically reviewed for scholarships. The admissions area looks at your GPA, your ACT, your class rank, and they decide what to offer, if anything. At the Stark campus, the deadline is March 1st. You have to be accepted to the Stark campus by March 1st. Other schools, may do it completely differently, especially private schools. Um, private schools, you're more likely to get into a separate scholarship application. Essays, getting letters of recommendation, you need to contact the school and find out their policy about that. The school will send you a scholarship offer letter, which lists the scholarships they're offering you. It's not the same as the award letter. The award letter will list the federal financial aid, grants and loans, and they may put the scholarships on also. So that's step one. Step two, um, local scholarships. Um, things like the Kiwanis Club or the Rotary Club, unions like the Teamsters or electrical workers, um, religious organizations, often church or temple has a small scholarship program. Employers, if you're a parent who works for a large company like Goodyear or Timken that has a scholarship program for students, children of employees, find out how to apply. If you work for a smaller company, it does not hurt to ask them if they would contribute toward your child's education. Maybe they would pay for books, for example. You're gonna find out soon enough, books are expensive. If you're a student, if you work for a large company like Burger King, you know they have a program, they have to. Um, sometimes they have tuition reimbursement, like Verizon has a tuition reimbursement program. Every year we get a few students come into the office that work for Verizon and they have a tuition reimbursement program. When it comes to local scholarships, talk to everybody and anybody you know. You'd be surprised what kind of leads you'll get. Um, veterans organizations like the VFW or AMVETS, there's all kinds. Um, the Italian American Club, you know how the Stark County Italian American Club has the Italian American Festival every year at the fairgrounds? Every year the repository does an article about the scholarships they're able to offer because of that. A good way to find local scholarships are high school websites. Like they were saying at the beginning, usually you go to the high school's website and then there's a link to the guidance department and then there's a link to the local scholarships that they know about. At Glen Oak, it appears that you have to log in yourself. That's pretty sophisticated. Most high schools, you don't do that. So there's nothing stopping you from going to Marlington's website and looking just, just to see, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Um, public libraries, you know how the Pub Stark County District Library has branches? There's one right here. Maybe the reference desk librarian might be plugged in about what's available locally. They say January, February, and March is the best time of the year to search for scholarships for the following year. You'd be surprised what little competition there is because students hate writing the essay. If you're willing to write a good essay, that puts you on the inside track right away. 
And it's like anything else. The more you do, the better you'll get and the faster you'll get at it. Every year you can do this. You know, it's not just for incoming freshmen. So that's step two, local scholarships. Finally, step three, you might want to try one or two of those large scholarship search engines. FastWeb is a popular one, College Board, or College Board is a popular one. They're all kind of similar. They ask you questions like, what's your GPA, what's your major, et cetera, and they give you a list of possibilities. Any specific questions about scholarships? Yes. Her question is, is it something you should do as a junior? Not really. Definitely not apply. You can start looking and seeing what's available locally, but the application window for two years from now is going to be sometime next year when they're a senior. Anything else? Um, yes, in the white there. Right. These local scholarships are on top of any scholarships they're offered from the school. So if they land a scholarship from the Plain Township Rotary Club, that's on top of anything they're getting from the school. Usually, almost always, the scholarship organization sends the check to the school, and the school cashiers it to the student's account, and it goes toward their tuition. If they send the check to the student themselves, it's usually made out to the student and the school, which means the student has to bring this scholarship check into the uh, school. Okay, question? Um, does being awarded a scholarship affect the amount of the, of the bonus? Does it count any Good question. Her question is, does an outside scholarship affect other financial aid? At Kent State, we will not reduce a scholarship or a grant. We'll always reduce a loan first. We're going to talk about this soon, but every school has to come up with what's called a cost of attendance, which is an estimate of all the different costs they may incur. They're not allowed to have more financial aid than that amount. And if you do have more financial aid than that amount, the school has to reduce something, and at Kent State, at least, we always reduce loans first. Other schools may do it differently. Okay? Other schools may lower the school scholarship. Like if you get a $1,000 outside scholarship, they may reduce the school scholarship by 1000 Kent State won't do that, but other schools may. Okay? Um, there's a question up here. Yes? Her question is, is there a limit to the amount of scholarships they can apply for? No. Apply for as many scholarships as you want. You'll never get so much scholarship money that we'll have to reduce scholarship money. And we'll talk more. You'll see why that is soon. Okay, question up here. Yes. His question is, does scholarships apply toward room and board? Yes. Um, if you're living on campus, your direct costs will be tuition, room plan, and food plan. The scholarship will go toward that total amount. At the Kent campus, if you're living on campus, full-time tuition is about 10000 and depending on what kind of room you get and what food plan you're on, you're looking at about eight or 9,000 more. So your direct cost, if you're living on campus, is about 18,000. The scholarship would go toward that. Now, if you're getting so much financial aid that you're getting more than what you owe the school, there's an overage, that overage will go to the student as a refund check that they can spend on books or gas money or anything else. That's more likely to happen if you're not living on campus and you're going to a less expensive school. 
Federal regulations prevent financial aid from dispersing or electronically paying to the school any earlier than 10 days before classes start. So the money pays out 10 days before classes start. If you're getting a refund, you'll probably get your refund right before classes start. Does that answer your question? Okay, good, good. Anything else before we move on? Good, good question so far. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk, we'll, that's coming up. Good questions. Moving on to loans. When we talk about federal student loans, we're talking about Stafford loans. Freshmen are allowed to have $5,500 per year in student loans, regardless of school. Depending on how high the EFC is, up to 3,500 of it would be subsidized, could be subsidized. Subsidized loan is interest-free while you're in school. Unsubsidized is where interest accrues or builds while you're in school. The interest rate is 3.8% fixed. You don't go into repayment till six months after you graduate. You can pay the loan down early without penalty. The loan is strictly in the student's name. They don't need to pass a credit check or have a cosigner like they would with a bank. Best case scenario, if you show the, enough financial need, 3,500 will be subsidized and 2,000 will be unsubsidized. If you don't show enough financial need, the EFC is too high, then more of it is going to be unsubsidized. But together, the two loans should add up to 5,500. If you need to use a loan, this is by far your best option. Use this first. Um, it's, much, it's better than what you'll find in a bank. The government is more liberal when it comes to repayment options than a bank. Um, they're more liberal when it comes to extending the deferment if you can't find a job right away. Use this first. And if you still have money, owe money, you might have to get an alternative loan from a bank. Okay with this slide? Oh, I wanted to mention, um, you know how I said there were three federal programs that had limited funding? The SEOG work study? The Perkins loan is the third one. Last year, Congress killed the Perkins program, so it's slowly fading away. But there's still money available. So schools get a certain amount of Perkins loan and nursing loan, and they award that as they see fit but it's slowly going away. Okay, the PLUS loan. PLUS is short for Parent Loan for Undergraduate Students. If the student's financial aid is not enough to cover them, this is one option to pay the rest. It's a federal loan in the parent's name through the FAFSA. You can see what the interest rate is. The government does run a credit check on the PLUS. Not with the student loan, but with the parent loan, yes. If the parent is denied, the student gets $4,000 more in unsubsidized loans on top of the $5,500 they're already getting, but only if the parent's denied. If the parent doesn't want to take out the Parent PLUS loan, they want everything to be in the student's name, then the student would have to get what we call an alternative loan. Some schools call them private loans. It's a loan from a bank. The student goes to any bank they want and applies for a student loan. Problem is, you're going to have to pass the bank's credit check, and at your age, that probably means a cosigner. 
My understanding is the Canton Student Loan Foundation does offer better terms than banks. So if you have to go down this route, you know, check them out. Also, compare banks. Um, my understanding is banks can offer any terms they want. It's up to you whether to accept them or not. Banks know that students use their FAFSA loan first and then come to them. So they jack up interest rates accordingly. You know how the interest rate on the subsidized and unsubsidized was 3.8%? Even with a good cosigner, most banks it's going to be like 8 or 9%. Plus, the bank is not as liberal when it comes to offering options with repayment. It's just not as good. So if you have to use a loan, use the sub and unsub first. Questions? Okay, now let's move on to this cost of attendance. All schools are required to come up with what's called a cost of attendance. It's estimates for six things. Tuition, room and board, books, transportation, miscellaneous, and loan fees. Those are not your direct costs. At the Stark campus, our cost of attendance is about 15000 but that's not what you owe Kent State. Stark Campus is a commuter school, so we don't have room and board. But we are required to come up with an estimate for room and board, even if the student is living at home for free. Your direct cost to Stark Campus is about 57 or 100 per year. Or you can split that evenly between the semesters. The Kent campus has a higher cost of attendance because tuition is more. It's about 10000 a year. Plus, the Kent campus has dormitories. We call them residence halls. So their room and board estimates higher than 3660. There are schools in Ohio, private schools, that are every bit as expensive as Ivy League. The biggest variable is uh, tuition. But again, you need to determine your direct cost to each school. Then you subtract the scholarships they're offering you. It's not how much scholarship they're offering you, it's how much you still owe. Right? OK, OK, good, good. <laughs> because, you know, at, if you apply to Kent State, you may get an incoming freshman scholarship from the Kent campus for $4,000. You may get one from the Stark campus for only $2,000. But remember, tuition at the Kent campus is $10,000. So $10,000 minus the $4,000 scholarship leaves you with $6,000 to go. At the Stark campus, tuition is about $5,700. So $5,700 minus $2,000 leaves you with $3,700 to go. You, you follow the? OK, good. Another thing, let's see if I can explain this. Financial need. We determine financial need as cost of attendance minus EFC. For example, let's say you do the FAFSA and your EFC is 20,000, which is high. But let's pick a nice even 20,000. If you're going to the Stark campus, Cost of attendance is 16,000. So 16,000 minus 20,000 is a negative number. You don't show financial need. So you're not going to get a subsidized loan. The entire 5,500 would be unsub. If you're at the Kent campus, though, cost of attendance is about 25,000. 25,000 minus 20,000 EFC is 5,000 of financial need. So you show financial need you show enough financial needs so that you'll be eligible for 3,500 sub. Right? Got it? OK, good. So you know, a lot of it depends on your EFC and how expensive the college is, what their cost of attendance is. Questions? OK. We're almost there. Um, timeline. Remember, the FAFSA is now available. So get busy on that. 
financial aid award letters. Again, all I can talk about is Kent State. We're hoping to start sending award letters out in mid to late December. In April, you'll probably make your decision on what college to attend. And then in summer, you know, make sure you have everything in place. If your financial aid covers your bill, great. If it doesn't, then you've got to think about a plus loan or an alt loan or maybe get on a payment plan. Like, you know, Kent State, we have installment payment plans that break it into monthly. And, you know, other schools do also. Here's a couple events at Kent State Stark Campus. And again, this is on the handout. If you're interested in Stark Campus, please contact us. We have six admissions counselors that will help you out, do everything they can for you. We have an actual campus preview where you can meet professors and things on a Saturday. We also have an in-person an in FAFSA filing workshop on a Saturday where if you come in with your tax information, we can help you submit the FAFSA. But again, you'll see the FAFSA isn't that as bad as we make it out to be. It, it really isn't. You can do the FAFSA on your own, definitely. Um, let's see. There's our information. If you have general questions, contact us. But if you're interested in a different school, you should really contact their financial aid office. That's the last slide. Are there any questions before we wrap up? There's been a lot of really good questions. Well, I wish you good luck. Um, I'll hang around for a little while to answer specific questions. But good luck to all of you. Thanks for such close attention. Good luck. <laughs>